have had a good week? Yes, sir. It'd just be good to be in the Lord's house today? Yes. How about I stand to number 79 at the cross? Number 79.
word, and I can't wait to get into it here in just a little bit. And uh, right now, though, we want to give you a few announcements and uh, be mindful that we have a brand new bulletin out there for the month of Feb or March, rather, out there. So be sure to pick that up, and it has several things in there that you need to note. Uh, first of all, understand that right now, this month is Missions Month. And uh, all this month, we're going to be emphasizing our missions program, talking about missionaries and, uh, and where they're at all around the world. And uh, then on the last Sunday of this month, we will be taking what we call a faith promise offering. And uh, if you're not quite sure uh, what that's all about, we want to encourage you to pick up uh, one of these little bulletins on the foyer table. And it's called Grace Giving, uh, Giving to Missions by Grace through faith, faith promise, uh, uh, missions giving. This is what this is all about. It'll explain it uh, more in detail. And uh, we will also be explaining it to you from the pulpit, especially on March the 28th. And I hope that you'll be here for that. Ladies, you have a special uh, fellowship April the 1st uh, at Jason's Deli. And so that's at 6.30. And uh, where's my wife? Is she not in here? Um, do they need to sign up or something? Uh, Miss Darling? Uh, okay, yes, all right. So it's not my fault. That's good. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, y'all, I hope that you'll be going. How many ladies are interested in that? You're going to probably attend that thing. Yeah, good, wonderful. And uh, then on April the 4th, as you know, is uh, our Resurrection Day, Resurrection Sunday. And uh, we come together on that day to celebrate the Lord coming out of the grave. Amen. Aren't you glad he came out of the grave? It's, it's because uh, that, that coming out of the grave notes to us that we're justified. Amen. Justified. So I love that. Uh, we will uh, have a candy hunt right after the morning service for the kids. We didn't get to do this last year. This is great. I'm excited. So what we need you to do is help us. You can find these eggs everywhere, these plastic eggs, and you can fill them with candy. Or you can fill them with coins, which is always nice. Or if you want to stick a, a bill in there, a dollar bill or whatever. And uh, uh, anyway, parents love that. And uh, <laughs> they, they find the eggs and get them anyway. Uh, but you can find these eggs everywhere. Now, we found these at Dirt Cheap, at Dirt Cheap, these big old eggs. And uh, they didn't have candy in them yet, but we put the candy and the coins in there. But we need your help. The more, the better. And we will have an area for the bigger kids to hunt. We'll have a smaller area for the smaller kids to hunt. And we'll have a great time after church uh, April the 4th for that. So please be mindful of that. All right, we need your help. Uh, let's see what else is going on. 7 o'clock, we have our Wednesday night online Bible study prayer time. I've been fooling around a little bit with the, uh, with, the, with the programming schedule on that, trying to figure out what the best way it is to do it. And, uh, you know, so anyway, bear with us about that. We, uh, we went right into the message this past Wednesday night. Who saw that Wednesday night? We went right into the message, and then we saved uh, uh, the time for prayer one night toward the end. Uh, but uh, may stay with that, uh, with that. Now, this Wednesday night, I'll go ahead and tell you, we've got a special guest taking the program Wednesday night. So you don't want to forget to tune in 7 o'clock uh, this coming Wednesday night, all right, uh, for our online Bible study. Youth Garage Sale, sale we're still scheduling that for May. If you have anything that you'd like to donate for the youth to make money on to help them with summer activities, we encourage you to do that, please. Uh, see Brother Caleb about that. He'd be glad to take uh, that or pick it up if you need to, all right? Uh, back on the foyer table, you will find the financial report available to you back there. We also have a new missionary support list. This will give you an idea, uh, or really the specifics of all the missionaries we support, where they are, how much we support them for, and what our monthly and yearly support level is at this point. So please take one of those, and that will help you understand, be able to better pray uh, for our missionaries. So all that's back there for you on the foyer table. Please go by and pick that up uh, today before you leave. And, uh, and I know uh, it'll be helpful to you. Um, I want to do something different this morning. Before we see the video and before we release the kids, I thought we might do something a little different this morning. And, uh, and, and I want to do it this way. I don't know how to say it, but I just want to encourage people to give. 
uh, as you know, we stopped passing the plate. Uh, so we're, we're not going to do that yet, but I want to give you an opportunity uh, to go to the offering box, all right, and to place your offering in there if you've not yet done that. Sometimes people will say, you know what, I passed right by that box, I forgot to put my offering in there. And I always say, well, just give it to me. <laughs> we'll take care of it. Uh, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to have you bow your head in just a moment, and the piano's going to play, and if you want during that time to get up and take your offering to the box, you can do that. Also, the missions jug is back out. So kids, if you want to go put some money in the jug, you can do that also during this time, all right? So let's stand. I know this is a little different. Let's stand. Get, get to your wallet, your purse, your, your tithing envelope, whatever it is, and let's ask God to help us give. And so I'm going to say a quick word of prayer. We're going to bow our heads, and then uh, let's keep our heads bowed. And those that want to go to the offering box can do that while the pianist plays. Father, bless this offering time in Jesus' name. All right, you play. If you need to go, put your offering or missions march money. You can do that. September of 2010, Tanya, uh, just a few months after I arrived, uh, we had been supporting, uh, we now have been supporting him, Luke Shelby, uh, for uh, 10 years now. He's in Kenya, East Africa. Now, he was already there when he came to visit with us, uh, but uh, he's been there 20 years now, over in Kenya, uh, East Africa, since 1999. Of course, Miss Starlin and I have known them for many, many years when they were back in college at Bible Baptist Church in Jacksonville. They are uh, with the Baptist International Missions Incorporated, B-I-M-I. -I, that's their missions agency. And friend, let me tell you something. As you're going to see in this uh, video here in just a moment, he is doing a phenomenal work there in Kenya. It's, it's just breathtaking. Thousands, literally thousands of uh, Africans have come to know the Lord I don't know how many churches have been started. He has a, uh, a Bible college uh, already set up, and uh, this year they've enrolled 55 new students in their, in their Bible college there in Kenya. And uh, this video that you're about to see it's, uh, was made in 2019, so it's maybe a couple of years old, but it does share the heart of these dear missionaries, and I want you to, I want you to see that, hear that, and feel that this morning. So let's listen to this. Missionary Luke Shelby in, in Kenya, Africa.
sent us to those areas and he's opened up many doors for us to be able to go down roads to over 200 villages and preach the gospel of Jesus and make a difference in the lives of those people. Thousands of people have come to know Christ as a personal savior. Many churches have been started because what God has done to help make a difference in that country. Many lives have been changed, and these are some of the men and ladies whose lives have been changed forever by the grace of God. My spiritual life is enriched by studying God's Word. There is peace of God in my family and joy. I have learned how to love my children and husband. This gospel has made a difference in my community through my soul winning and witnessing. I first heard the gospel being preached directly to me in the year 2012 during youth camp. I believed the word that Jesus died for my sins, therefore I invited Christ into my life, and I have seen tremendous change in my life. Through this gospel, I am able to preach to my family members, and Christ is doing a great work in my family. But since I received Jesus into my life, He has changed my life, uh, my family, and even the community. Uh, many people believe the gospel, and their lives are changing each and every time. And even my brothers uh, got saved, and I have peace in my mind and my heart. That salvation is free and forever in Jesus Christ. We have seen a home visitation turn into a weekly Bible study, and after six months has actually turned into a church. And to be able to see that church grow and evangelize to their own people and to spread the gospel to start other churches in, in areas around them as well. It's been a joy to my heart to see the Lord working in the hearts and lives of the ladies that we minister with, seeing them learn to love their children and their husbands the way that God has taught us to do in His Word. It's made tremendous changes, and we've seen incredible growth in their families, the closeness of the family unit, and these ladies are reaching out to their neighbors and teaching them also. My heart is there with them. I love those ladies and their children. Seen in all that God has called us to be missionaries there and has given us the privilege to stand there, to stand in the gap and show those people God's love and the hope of eternal life through Jesus Christ. 
and we are looking forward to seeing what God is going to do with these families. Many doors have opened to preach the gospel in Kenya, but there are still so many who have not been reached. Hundreds of villages and towns that have no gospel witness and people are struggling and dying without hope. We will continue to have compassion to make a difference. We still need your help to make a difference as you pray and as you give. We still need you to send us. Would you come to Kenya and help us have compassion and make a difference? Thank you so much for your prayers and your financial support as you've supported us for the last 20 years in the country of Kenya. all about folks amen? Amen. amen amen trying to get folks saved praise the lord all right hand you sing for us Hey. 
like them uh, countless kids. Y'all ready to go? All right, turn me on back here, brother. All right, here we go. All right, compass kids, you're dismissed. Amen. I understand Brother Braden is going to be uh, giving the uh, message this morning back in kids' church, so y'all pray for him. He's excited and nervous. That's our preacher boy, Amen. Pray for that guy. Excited about what God's going to do in his life. Amen. I want to ask you to turn with me to the book of Philippians this morning. Chapter number one. The book of Philippians. You find that please. Galatians, Ephesians. Philippians. Chapter one. We're going to look at one verse this morning. And I'm going to preach for about an hour. <laughs> All right. That dear lady from Ohio may not be back. <laughs> Praise the Lord. She said she's Methodist. Is that right? Did I, did, were you Methodist? I, no, I was talking about something else. Did you say what you were, ma'am? Huh? You're a Christian, right? Well, that's good enough. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to uh, share a story with you to open the service this morning, open the message. You hold on to your place, and we'll get to that in just a minute. Many years ago, in the early 1900s, there was a young man by the name of William Borden. William was the sole heir of the giant Borden Milk Company. When he graduated, obviously he was from a family of a very uh, high esteem and uh, uh, financial security, and so his father decided that he would send young William on a trip around the world. That was to be his graduation gift. So young William set sail and began to visit all the, the major countries around the world and began to see the sights. And something happened to William while he was in those foreign places. His heart began to tender as he looked into the faces of people without hope, many of them that just were helpless and hopeless and his heart broke for him. And by the time he came home from that trip around the world, William Borden had surrendered his life to the Lord's service. He told his folks he wanted to be a missionary. He wrote in his journal these words, I will say no to self and yes to Christ. Lord, change me. Cleanse me and use me as thou shalt choose. He dedicated his college years to mastering the word of God. And when he graduated, William set sail for China. That's where he felt God would want him to go. During his stop in Egypt, William contracted spinal meningitis. And he died a month later. Some might say, what, what a waste. What a waste. A millionaire turned missionary. And now he's dead with meningitis before he even gets to the field. But his story inspired countless others to surrender to missions. And there's no telling the impact that his life and his testimony made on so many others when they probated his will, it was discovered that William had left all of his entire fortune, well over a million dollars at that time in the early 1900s, and he left all of it to the cause of Christ and the missions. 
It was in that moment that his family found his Bible, his personal Bible, and recorded inside the cover of his Bible, he had written these words, three, phase, three phrases, no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. No reserves, no retreat, no regrets. That should be the motto of every Christian. It is certainly the motto, I believe, of every true, sincere missionary. We talked about the mandate a couple of Sunday or Sunday ago. We talked about the motivations of a missionary. This morning I want to talk about this motto of every missionary and every mission-minded church ought to be this, no reserves, no retreats, no regrets. Would you stand with me as we read Philippians chapter 1 and verse 21? One verse, the Apostle Paul, the great missionary, wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit these words, listen to it, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Would you, would you say that with me this morning? Looking at the verse again, let's say it together. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Dear Father, this morning I ask now that you help this verse, that it might infiltrate our hard hearts, help us to see ourselves as you see us, help us to see ourselves in the mirror of God's word this morning. Help us to compare for just a few moments our life to the life of a man or a woman who commits themselves to the field of missions. Come hell or high water, get fat or die skinny, they're committed. They're, con they're convicted, they're convinced that this is what God would have for them in their lives. Lord, help us to see how we compare to that. Lord, how important it is that we do the same in our own lives, no matter where you've called us, whatever our field. Help me to say what you'd have me say. And then, Lord, I pray today that what I say would be a blessing and a help and certainly a challenge and encouragement to God's people. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. You might be seated. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. I have a friend, I hadn't thought about it just until this moment, and uh, this dear friend for many years ago was a great example of the Lord in his life, was a great man of God, and when he died, he asked that this might be put on his tombstone, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Amen. What was Paul saying? Paul was saying, in essence, those three phrases, no reserves, no retreat, no regrets. For me, life is not about me. To me, life is about Jesus. Everything I am, everything I have, everything I desire, every goal in my life, every ambition in my life, every love in my life, every desire in my life, wrapped around Jesus. For to me, to live, for to me, my life, is Christ. No reserves, no reservations. It's all His. And if God chooses to use me for a long time, or if God chooses to use me but a short time, when that time comes when He's through with me, I will count it as gain. Amen. I will count it as profitable. I won't, I won't say to self, self, you could have done better. I won't say to self, self, you could have went, went down that road. I won't say to myself, self, you could have made money. Self, you could have had pleasure. Self, you could have had possessions. Self, you could have been famous. You could have had popularity. I won't say to self, I, I wonder what it would have been like to go down that road or that road or that road. No, I'll not say those things. I will sum it up by saying that whatever happens to me in God's will is gain. I will count it as profitable. I will count it as if knowing that I have done exactly what God put me here to do. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. 
No reserves. No retreat. No regrets. What does that mean? No reserves. What does that mean? We have a man in our church, and uh, you know him well, that likes to buy cars. He loves automobiles. He loves to buy them. He loves to build them. He loves showing them off. Of course, I'm talking about Brother Red. <laughs> Just ask him. You know how some people carry, uh, older folks carry uh, pictures of their grandkids in their wallet? He carries pictures of cars. Yeah, cars. Now, Brother Red will know this, but for everyone else, do you know the difference between reserve and no reserve at an auction? There's a difference. In basic terms, a car being sold at reserve means that there has been an undisclosed minimum sale price attached to that car by the seller. The norm in reserve collector auctions has become that, uh, that the seller sets the reserve price too high, mostly by overvaluing the vehicle, and the car, therefore, doesn't end up hitting the minimum sometimes, the minimum threshold at an auction. When a car doesn't reach its perceived amount, two things can happen. The auctioneer can try to get the seller to drop the reserve price which normally works to, to no avail, or the car gets brought back to the auction block a second time to try to get someone to pay the reserve price. But when a car is being auctioned at no reserve, that car is for sale with no restrictions. The highest bidder will get that car with zero threshold to meet. Amen. Are you listening? That car will be sold to the highest bidder with no reservations. Think about that for a moment. When a person approaches God for any reason, understand that God expects that it be under the terms of no reserve. No reservations. Total and complete surrender to whatever God wants. So many people try to bargain with God, though, don't they? You ever tried to bargain with God and say, well, God, I'll do this and this, but I need you to do that and that. Or somebody might say, well, God, I'll do this and this, uh, but I have to get rid of this and this, and I have to do that and such and such. And, and, and listen to me, God is not looking for bargains. Amen. Right. God's not looking for somebody to argue with or somebody to deal with or somebody to bargain with. That's not the way God works. He's looking for complete surrender. No reserves, no reservations. Can I tell you something this morning? When it comes to salvation, it's got to be no reserve. No reservations. What do you mean, preacher? I don't believe most people really understand what happened when they got saved. I don't think, I don't think you really understood what happened. You didn't get saved because you said a prayer. Right. Amen. Amen. Right. You didn't get saved because you said a prayer. You didn't get saved because you knelt down or bowed down or, or bowed your head. You didn't get saved because you recited certain words. Or maybe as, as I've often done with somebody leading them to Christ who say, repeat a prayer after me and so they repeat a prayer. That didn't, that's not what saved them. Listen to me. What got them saved was surrender. For with the heart Man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But my friend, there's a big difference between the mouth and the heart. And a lot of people live in by mouth and not heart. A lot of people pray in by mouth and not heart. You listening to me? A lot of people come into God with mouth but not heart. And a lot of people are thinking they're getting saved. A lot of people think they're going to heaven because they said something. They spoke a prayer. They recited a prayer, but it wasn't in their heart. And as I've heard many preachers say, they're going to miss heaven by 18 inches. That's the difference between the head and the heart. They got it here, but not here. For even the devils believe and tremble. That's why there are multitudes of Americans this morning who think they're going to heaven, but they're not because they recited a prayer from their lips, but they never surrendered their soul to the Lord. It's got to be surrendered. That's the Christian life. The Christian life is all about surrender. Amen. It's all about you giving up 
yourself to God. That's a, that's a hard thing. Here's the gospel in modern language. Come give your heart to Jesus. God will forgive you of all your sins and you can go and live your best life now. That's the modern gospel. The modern gospel says all of God's works for you and it's all about you. All you have to do is just receive them into your life and you can go out and fulfill all your dreams. You can go about all your business. You can do whatever you want to do because now you're under grace and God's going to prosper you and it's all about you. And my friend, that's the, that is the antithesis of the gospel in the Bible. The gospel, the Bible gospel is this, you surrender to him. I know a lot of people don't like this phrase, lordship salvation. But can I tell you something? The Bible says if you commit, confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You don't just piddle around with this thing. You don't just give God, uh, you know, a little tip and say, okay, God, here I am. And yeah, I invite you in the heart and go out and go about living your life like you want to live. That's not the way it's about. It's about surrender. You surrender. Listen, when I came to Christ and when you came to Christ, if you're truly saved this morning, you came to Christ with the idea that I'm a sinner. I'm lost. I have no way of saving myself. I cannot do this on my own. You came to God knowing that if God didn't save you, you was hopeless. Amen. Yeah, surrender. I wonder how many in this room this morning that you need to be saved because you've never come to God like that. You came to God thinking this was a bargain, this was a deal, you know. Some preacher got up and said, man, if I got the deal for you today, you better come, bargain, basement, bargain, bargain, basement. Come on, uh, you come and we'll will and deal and, and get you saved and once you're saved, you can go out and live like you want to do. That kind of gospel is what's killing us as a country today. And it's killing our churches because you got people that are not convicted and not committed and they will not persevere. They will not stay with it because it's just a little something they dabble in. Right. They've never surrendered. Yeah. They surrender. There is no salvation without surrender. There is no supplication without surrender. No reserves when it comes to your prayer life. Supplication means prayer. God loves answering prayer, folks, but prayer must be accompanied by surrender. You don't come to God and say, now lay me down to sleep. I'll play your prayer to the Lord, my soul to keep. Bless mom and daddy, Uncle Joe, Uncle Pat, uh, Patty, uh, uh, Uncle Patty, uh, uh, Aunt Patty, uh, and, 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 and bless all the boys and girls, da, 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 go to sleep. There, there's more to your, I hope there's more to your prayer life than that. I don't know how many times I've prayed with great men of God in the greatest prayers I've ever heard were the prayers for men that could hardly pray. I remember one time I prayed with a godly man and we had knelt down and, and he said, I'll pray first and you can pray. And I sat there and we both knelt down and I can remember it felt like eternity before he said his first word. But you could hear him going, Oh, 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 what was he doing? He was humbling himself before the Lord. He was humbling himself before God. Did you know prayer takes time? Did you know prayer takes work? Did you know that prayer takes energy? Did you know that prayer will take you and take your life? Because that's what it demands. If you're going to get a hold of God and get God to answer your prayers, you're going to have to surrender. You're not going to come to God like some bratty stepchild and say, God, I want this for Christmas. That's not the way God works. You come to God, humble yourself before Almighty God. You can't do that with an ounce of pride. You've got to get rid of the pride. You've got to get rid of the self. You've got to surrender to God. Jesus taught his disciples to pray in Matthew chapter 6. In these words, he said, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. In the garden on the eve of his crucifixion, Jesus prayed to his Father. In Mark chapter 14, verse 36, he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. That's true prayer. That's true prayer. Kind of quiet in here this morning. That's the problem with so much of Christianity in our day. It's just not surrendered. We hadn't surrendered to be saved. We hadn't surrendered to supplicate. And it's got to be no reserves. It's got to be complete surrender when it comes to service. To service. What do you think the Lord is looking for? 
when he looks for a servant? What do you think God's looking for the most? Somebody might say, well, I'm a pretty good speaker, God. I'm a pretty good singer, God, use me. I'm a pretty good leader, use me. I, I can make a pretty good deacon, choose me. Uh, God, I can, I, can, I can be a good teacher, Lord, choose me. I can be a pretty good missionary, choose me. And I think God just says, mm, no, not yet. Something missing. I'll tell you what's missing. Somebody has wisely put it like this, that the most important ability that God is looking for in any servant is availability. Just laying yourself out there before the Lord and saying, God, whatever you want to do with me, I'm yours. Amen? Amen? Amen. Here's why. Would you go with me in your Bibles and turn with me to, to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 for a moment? 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I want you to see this, and I want you to, I want you to mark it in your Bible. For those of you who are truly interested in serving the Lord, who are truly interested in giving God your life in service, here's the verses you need. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 26. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen. Yea, and things which are not, nothing, to bring to naught things that are. Why? Here's why. That no flesh should glory in his presence. I can't come to God with my thumbs and my lapel and say, okay, God, you got something here. I got something. I, I, need, I need to do such and such because I'm somebody. No, sir. I don't get no glory. You don't get no glory. He gets all the glory. Amen. 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 You know what God's looking for? In Romans chapter 12, the Bible says, Be not conformed to this world, but be it transformed by the renewing of your mind. And just before that, in verse 1, Paul said it like this, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Now listen to me carefully. How many of you, I don't, I'm kind of a, a stickler about stuff, a little bit of a, what you call it, perfectionist? So I hang the pictures in my house. I hang the pictures. Charlie has no idea how to do this. I know how to use a tape measure. Amen. Now I know I want every picture a certain height Amen. around my house. Nothing here takes me more. If I come to your house, I see two pictures that ought to be coinciding with each other, and one of them's up here, one of them's down here. I got a problem. Amen. Amen. We, we're going to have to deal with this. Amen. So I get my tape measure out. And I put that tape measure up there. Let me put on this. I put that tape measure up there, down from the ceiling, so many inches. And okay. And I put my finger there. That's where I'm put the nail. And so I reach around. I got my nail. Put it up there. And I reach around, and my hammer is clean across the room. <laughs> I can't leave this. And I've got it set ready. So what do you do? You look around. Take your shoe off. <laughs> you hammer, hammer that nail with your shoe. Or maybe you got a, a book sitting there and you hammer it with the book. What are you doing? You're grabbing the thing closest to you. Now, the ideal instrument would be a hammer, but the hammer's not available. But that shoe's available. That book's available. Amen. So you use what's available. And somebody said that God can hit an awfully straight lick with an awful crooked stick. And the fact is, God can use who he wants to use so long as they're available. Amen. And that's what every missionary's got to do. They've just got to say, Lord, here I am. I'm available. And that's what every Christian needs to say to God. Hey, I'm available. No reserves. No reservations. I'm yours. Lock, stock, and barrel. God, here I am. That's the way God wants it this morning. And, and, and think about this for a moment. Some of you, I, I think about the folks in this church this morning. i got some of the best folks in the world, and I love all of you. But I wonder how many of you have missed the mark this morning. You, you, you sinned. You know what? The word sin means to miss the mark. You know exactly what God wants you to do in your life and you're not doing it. Right. You're not doing it. Someone's wife has said that God doesn't call every Christian to be a missionary, but every Christian ought to struggle with the prospect. Amen. That's good. You ought to at least struggle with it. Is God calling me? 
to be a missionary? Is God calling me to be a preacher? Is God calling me to be a teacher? Is God calling me in this way or another in his service? Every one of us ought to struggle with that and figure that out. God wants you to. But it's got to be no reserves. Number two, no retreat. No retreat. Every Christian, remember, is a soldier in the army of the Lord. Every Christian is a soldier in the army of the Lord. Every soldier is taught and trained to be an overcomer, a finisher. That's exactly what the great apostle Paul was testifying to in 2 Timothy chapter 4. If you'll turn with me for a moment. 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 4. Some of the last words that the apostle Paul wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and at the end of his life, and he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, Beginning of verse 6, for I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. In other words, no retreat. No retreat. I've never retreated. You see, my friend, this morning, that's exactly what God is looking for. He's looking for folks who've decided not to retreat. Amen. It's interesting in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 13 through 17, you don't have to turn there, but we find what the Bible calls the whole armor of God. In that armor is the girdle of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of the gospel of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. But you will notice in those verses that there is no armor for the backside. Right. None. No armor for the backside. No armor to cover the back, back of the head, back of the neck. No armor for the buttocks. No armor for the hind legs in the back. None. You know why? I guess because if you retreat, you just you ought to be stuck. Ain't no retreating in God's army. Advancing, no retreat, advancing, no retreat, advancing. Always going forward, always making sure that that next step. Now, look, here's what happens to a good Christian. Two or three steps forward in the fight for God, and the devil knocks you back. A couple of steps. But so long as you don't turn around, you're going to be all right. You're going you're gonna to get hit back. You're even going to fall. But a righteous man falls, just man falls seven times and rises up again and goes forward again. Amen. And that's what God put you here to do. Never retreat. This month is Missions Month here at Southwest Baptist Church. And I'll be honest with you, I said this in Sunday school, our mission support list has not grown over the past year. In fact, it has grown smaller. It's gotten smaller. And the reason is this. Many, many missionaries are coming home. The, the, the battle has been hard. Many, for health reasons, some have passed away. I, I know a couple that's passed away, but many of them have said, you know, this is so hard. We can't do it anymore. Um, we're coming back. They've taken churches in the states, positions and, and missions boards, other places. And so many of our missionaries have come off the field. Now, I'm not calling them bad. I'm just saying that there have been some, if not many, that have come home, I think, without God's leadership. When they should have just said, this is where God put me, this is where I'm going to stay. Amen. 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 Tough. It's a tough world we live in. By the way, friend, listen, if you had not noticed that, something ain't right. This, this world's tough. Yeah. And tough on people, and it's been tough on me as a preacher. And I got the best church in the world. Yeah. Where are you? Say amen. amen. I said, I got the best church in the world. Amen. All right. I, I get to preach to some of the best Christians I know. That's, but I'm telling you, there are times when the devil's all over me about stuff. Worry about this. Worry about that. Worry about my health. Worry about this person, that person. Worry about the finances. Worry about, and, and so much worry. And I remind you, oh, the Lord says, be careful for nothing but in everything but prayer and supplication that your request be known. I know all that. It's hard not to worry, isn't it? I woke up this morning feeling a little better than I did last night. Friday night, I was biting into a peanut and my tooth split in two. Oh, wow. And that ever had that? Anybody had that done? You ever had a tooth split? Uh, 
your tongue never gets used to that. <laughs> uh, it just don't feel right, does it? Thank God there's no pain. Amen. But it just seemed odd. It seemed like you get these ideas. You know how the devil plants thoughts in your mind? Dave, you're falling, stinking <laughs> up on it. It ain't going to be long now, Dave. First it's the teeth, then it's the hair. Yep. Now you can't imagine me being bald headed, can you? <laughs> then it's the voice, then it's, I mean, you're gone, you're gone. You call, call the funeral home. You just set up. You know how the devil does you? Sometimes you got to look at yourself in the mirror and just say, Self, uh, get past yourself. Amen. 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 It, it, it's not about me anyway, it's about the Lord. Now, thank God I feel pretty good this morning, amen. And I got up this morning, I felt a little encouraged this morning. I don't know what it was through the night, but I got up this morning feeling a little encouraged. Look, I don't like change. Nobody, nobody likes change. I'd rather have a whole tooth than half a tooth. Nobody likes change. And I'll probably get that thing pulled in anyway. But the fact is, this morning, nobody likes change. But you've got to embrace it. And say, so no matter what comes my way, no matter what's happening in my life, I will not retreat. God put me here to stay. Amen. God put me here to work, to serve, to do what he wills. It's not about me. It's about him. Amen. No reserves. No retreat. No retreat. No retreat. Out of every 500 people, they say, that are called to the mission field, only 100 surrender and prepare to go. Out of that 100, only five finish. Two actually go to the field, one returns, and only one sticks it out. One out of 500. William Carey, the great missionary, went to India in 1793 and saw no converts for seven long years. But before he died, he had translated the Bible into 40 different Indian languages he is quoted as saying, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. Amy Carmichael once said, mission work offers one thing and one thing only, the chance to die. The chance to die. It's interesting in, first, uh, in the book of Acts chapter 1 and verse uh, 8, I think it is where he said, you shall be witnesses unto me. Remember the verse? Both in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all the earth, there's that word witness. You should be witnesses. It's the word in the Greek, martyros, where we get our word martyr. We're to be martyrs for the Lord. Martyrs. Every time you take a stand and use one ounce of energy for the Lord, you're giving your life to the Lord. You're giving your time, your energy. You're basically killing yourself for the Lord. That might not sound like an ideal situation, but that's a good thing because that's what God called us to do. Amen. Hey. Wow. I'm going to have to have a whole message now on killing yourself for the Lord. But that's what he's called us to do. Well, wait a minute, preacher. Now, surely that ain't what God wants. I mean, come on now. i got a bucket list. Things I want to do. Places I want to go. We all do. All things we want to do and we think we need to do. And, and sure, there's a lot of things, but you don't know what God might want from you. That's why we ought to say every day of our life, I will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Not what I want, but what you want. No reserves, no retreats. Number three, no regrets. Have you ever regretted something in your life? Amen. Come on now. Amen. I know I have. To be regretful means to feel sad, repentant, or disappointed over something. Listen carefully, and I'm almost done. Bronnie Ware is an Australian nurse who spent several years working in palliative care. That's caring for patients at the end of their life. We call it hospice care. She recorded or began to record their dying epiphanies in a blog called Inspiration and Child which gathered so much attention that she put her observations into a book called The Top Five Regrets of the Dying. Here are the top five regrets discovered by the nurse, Bronnie Ware. Regret number five, I wish that I had let myself be happier. 
People admitted that they feared change in their lives so much that they pretended to be happy. Regret number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. Many felt badly that they had been so caught up in their own lives that they let important friendships slip away. Regret number three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Many suppressed important thoughts and feelings in order to keep peace with others. Regret number two, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. This regret was expressed by every male patient, every single one of them. I wish I hadn't worked so hard. Regret number one, you know what it was? I wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself, not the life somebody else expected me to live. This was the most common regret of all. Notice one thing that wasn't on the list. Not one ever said I regretted serving the Lord. I've regretted giving my life to Jesus. I've regretted serving the Lord. Not one person said such a thing. Let me give you a personal illustration. I don't know about you, but I can make a long list of things in my life that I regret. And I'm serious. I could. Decisions I've made in the spur of the moment. Opportunities that I let go by. Words that slipped through these unguarded lips. A lot of things I regret. Maybe you too can make a long list. But one thing I've never, 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 never regretted in my life. I have never regretted that summer night in 1976 when I knelt at an old-fashioned altar at the First Church of God, 2214 uh, Green Hills Drive in Kilgore, Texas. And knelt down at that altar and Brother Jim Holyfield, my pastor, big coon hunting Mississippi preacher, knelt down beside me. And that night I surrendered my life to the Lord. I'll never forget it's like yesterday. I'd gotten saved, but it had been a few months or maybe not so many weeks. But I remember that one night I was sitting there listening to the preacher and it just seemed like I was under such a burden about something I couldn't figure it out. At the invitation, I came forward and knelt at the altar. And, and of course, Brother Jim come down beside me and knelt, put his arm around me. And he said, Dave, why are you here? I said, Preacher, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I know I'm saved and things right. I've been reading my Bible and praying. I don't know what's wrong, Preacher. I just feel all teary and I don't know. Something on my heart. Brother Jim said, maybe God's calling you into the ministry. It was like a, a bell went off in my head. I said, what do I do? What do I do? He said, surrender. Just surrender. That night I surrendered to the gospel ministry. And I'm telling you, I wish I could say that every day was, was a great day after that. But boy, it was a lot of challenges, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, fights and battles. But, but I thank God now, 44 plus years later, that I'm still preaching the gospel. And I'm glad I made that decision. I, don't, I never regretted that. Eric Henry Little. In the 1981 movie, Chariots of Fire, that Chariots of Fire was a great movie. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Won the Academy Award for Best Picture that year in 1981. It's one of the few films in Hollywood about a person that is really true to their history in a positive way. Eric Little was the son of missionary parents in China who found out early in life that he had a gift for running. He was so good during his college years that he was chosen to participate in the 1924 Olympics that were held in Paris that year. But Little forfeited his chance to run in the 200-meter dash at the 1924 Paris Olympics, the one race he was sure to win because the qualifying meet was to be held on Sunday. His coach and some others tried to convince him to change his mind, but Eric was willing to hold to his convictions Amen. no matter what it might cost him personally. Amen. Think about that for a moment. The stand that Eric Little took, he refused to participate in a race that would be watched by the whole world simply because it was on Sunday. Some would say, what a waste. What a fool to do such a thing. I wonder how many would uh, would disagree with Eric's position. 
Today, most Christians see Sunday as just the day we happen to meet for church. Many feel there's really nothing special about the day, and going to church on Saturday night or Wednesday night is just as good. Who, who's, who's right? Eric Little and other Christians who have been zealous in their efforts to observe the Lord's day or the many Christians today who have no qualms about playing, shopping, or working on Sunday. This is our Christian Sabbath, if you would, the Lord's day. After winning the 400-meter run that was held later that week in the Paris Olympics, 1924, Eric Little went back to China as a missionary. He died in a Japanese internment camp in 1945. On his deathbed, he was asked one more time why, why he had lived so fervently by his Christian convictions. And the final words of this great Christian missionary were these. It was complete surrender. John Whittier was a Quaker and a poet. And you've heard this, but he's the one who came up with it. And his little phrase, this little ditty says this, for of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these. It might have been. For of all the sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest of these, it might have been. No reserves, no retreat, no regrets. William Borden's in heaven. Do you think your regrets doing what he did? Not at all. I wonder how many this morning that you're, you know that God wants you to do a thing and you're not doing it. I'm not talking about missionary work altogether. I'm not talking about being a preacher. I'm just talking about you know what you ought to be doing, but you're not doing it and you're letting that thing slip by when this ought to be your motto. Amen. God, no reserves. I'm yours. Lock, stock, and barrel. Everything. I'm yours. I'm yours. No retreat. Devil, I'm here to stay. Amen. I'm going forward. I may get hit. I may get backed up a time or two, but I'm going forward. Amen. No retreat. No regrets. Someday when I come to the end of my life, I want to be able to say that. Oh, I've got some regrets in the physical realm. I've got some regrets in the financial realm. I've got some regrets, a lot of regrets. But not in preaching the gospel and living for Jesus. Never, never regret that. Not for a minute. Best decision I ever made. Father, I pray that you... Bless this message to our hearts this morning. And I pray that some of us, Lord, in this room would fall in an old-fashioned altar this morning and just say, Lord, I'm yours, lock, stock, and barrel. Whatever you want in my life, I'm here. I'm available. No reserves, no retreat, no regrets. I ask it in Jesus' name. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Would you stand with me? Heads bowed and eyes closed. I wonder how many would step out this morning as the, as the guitar begins to play, but John begins to play. Maybe just find a place and just pray and say, Lord, here I am. I don't know how you can use me. I don't know why you can even use me, but I'm yours. Lock, stock, and barrel. I'm yours. Maybe this morning you backslid in some area. Maybe some area of your life is not what it ought to be. Come on. Find a place. Pray about it. Let God hear from you this morning. How important it is that we be God's. I mean totally. Present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Let God have his way. Let God have his way. If you're not saved this morning, let me ask you, why? What's holding you back from being saved? I wonder those in the church this morning that are standing there in your pew, you say, preacher, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt if I die today, I'd go to heaven, I know I'm saved. Could you lift your hand high as a testimony? I know I'm saved on my way to heaven. I thank Jesus for that. God bless you. Maybe you can raise your hand. You say, preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. I need to be saved. Pray for me. Would you be honest? I'm watching. I'm looking. Would you slip your hand up where I can see it? I'm not sure I'm saved. Pray for me. Christian, what about it? The night I got saved, I had a I was a young man, 17 years old, long hair, hippie, life wasting away with drugs and alcohol. And somebody invited me to church. I came to church and I had a had a, a girl with me. 
And I almost didn't get saved because I didn't want to embarrass myself in front of that girl. I almost didn't leave my pew and go down and get saved because I thought, what was she thinking about? You know what? you got to come to a place in your life where you got to say, you know what? I don't care what anybody thinks except God. That's all. I've got to do what God told me to do. Surrender. Surrender. That's it. That's it. people said. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, God bless you this morning. Thank you for coming, being with us today. It's a good crowd. Pray for each other. Pray for those who are sick and out and uh, just continue to be uh, the light God called you to be. Don't forget to get some tracks on your way out. Share those tracks with folks this week. Let, let them know where you go to church and if they don't know the Lord, how to be saved. Do that. And uh, we'll see you back next Sunday. Don't forget to tune in Wednesday night. Special speaker, all right? You want to do that, 7 o'clock Wednesday night. Pray for Miss Starlin and I. We'll be traveling this afternoon. We want to see our son in Texarkana. Uh, pray for him. He's uh, got some issues right now he's dealing with. And In fact, uh, just really pray hard to God to bless him and help him. And uh, pray for Brother Ben also, my son-in-law. You know him. Uh, going through some church issues right now. Needs our prayers. You pray for him. But all of us have something, don't we? Amen. Everybody's going through something. Let's pray for each other. All right. Let's be dismissed this morning in prayer. John L. Free, do that for us. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the, the opportunity to be in your house this morning. Thank you for this message that was preached, Lord. I, I pray that it would, uh, Lord, just challenge us and, and uh, burden us to the point that we surrender to you, Lord, and your will. Lord, I pray you just give us strength and, and grace, and Lord, I give us mercy. If we need it, Lord, I pray you just bless us throughout this rest of this week and bring us back safe to the next point in time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.